Um, just speaking from anecdotal evidence, it seems like those who are concerned about private transport and actually drive cars would also be much more uh, wealthy in general in terms of income. Um, some of those results you talked about in terms of private transport and then other variables, um, does in I don't know if income was measured in the survey, um, but would that potentially track these results even better or in the same way? I'm just wondering if the actual behavior in terms of driving is, is relevant or if it's just a matter of wealth. Okay, Michael, please. Yeah, the, the relationship of uh, income is very interesting here, but it doesn't show up in a number of these variables in the way you might expect. Now, you're correct about the relationship between uh, income and uh, driving. Uh, certainly, folks in the upper ranges of income are more likely to drive. Um, but the, the income effect uh, is different from the driving effect. Uh, there seems to be folks who have the same degree of income uh, don't behave the same way as the folks who have the same income but drive. Um, it's, it's just a weird thing. <laughs> I was joking around uh, with Yan Yan and saying, well, it looks to me like if we really want to change people's behavior, we should buy everybody a Prius. Um, but of course, <laughs> that would cause all kinds of problems in other ways. Um, but it, but it, 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 it's really quite interesting. Uh, you'll see in the full report uh, that drivers active actually have a much stronger uh, response and support for many uh, pro-environmental efforts uh, than folks who are not drivers. Uh, and the, the, the economic side uh, really doesn't show up uh, anywhere near to that degree. Yes, the lady in the front, please. I have a question about the design. Um, you put the energy use and the climate change together, you say, but I don't think the behavior should be the same. Some people care about the energy use because they care about their energy bill, but they may not care about climate change at all. You know, we, in, in the full report, uh, we go into those differences. Uh, we actually ask people at one point uh, to compare uh, their concerns uh, for their, their worry about climate change and worry about uh, environmental effects uh, or, excuse me, uh, energy costs. So we've got a whole section where we go into those relationships. And of course, we know as, as folks who are more informed on this uh, issue um, that there is a relationship, of course, uh, between uh, energy use and, and the environment. And there are trade offs, of course, uh, in terms of climate change. Uh, and the environment. Uh, you probably know that in uh, the United States and uh, uh, some you know, sectors of Europe uh, right moment, uh, so-called um, um, you know, uh, well, it's hard to say exactly how they're described. It's environmentalists who argue that our only alternative is to use nuclear energy. That's the only way we can address uh, for example, the uh, seemingly more and more out of control uh, increase in, in carbon and heating that's going on. Uh, and so, of course, that puts them at loggerheads with a number of other environmentalists in terms of uh, nuclear power. Uh, so this is certainly one of the key areas of trade-off. Uh, that makes it very difficult, I think, for us to try to separate the two. Uh, if you have a separate survey on each of those, then you're not able to compare those issues. Uh, so in the full report, you'll see where we try to get into those uh, relations and some of those trade-offs. We also had a series of focus groups uh, that got into some of those trade-offs a, a bit more. So, yes. Gentleman at the back. Yeah. <clears throat> Michael, I was actually interested by the uh, comments on affordability. Last year when CLP raised its rates, there were public demonstrations but I've never heard of any public demonstrations with respect to energy security or environmental uh, aspects. Is it possible that people are actually not responding accurately? Yes, Michael, not I, responding I correctly. lost the last part of that question. People are not responding accurately to can you repeat that? In, in other words, the they're, last saying, part of your question. they're saying they're not concerned about affordability, they're concerned about other things, but they demonstrate with respect to rates. Is, is there some mismatch there? Yeah. 
Yeah, that, that's a that, that whole question of affordability is a, is a really um, interesting one uh, because you get into the, um, the other research work we've done that relates to the uh, wealth gap, uh, and you get an entirely different sector of the community um, that um, you can't say identifies with the poor, uh, but certainly see themselves as advocates of the poor. Um, and so what we find is there's a real difference between the folks who are actually poor, well, for example, in terms of reading energy labels uh, or uh, changing their light bulbs, um, and then folks who see themselves as advocates for the poor and argue that they understand the impact, for example, of rate increases uh, on the poor. What we also know is that there are a lot of people in Hong Kong who have higher incomes uh, who are supporting uh, elderly parents who actually are poor. So they hear from them uh, about the effects of these rates on them as well. Uh, and what we've found in separate research uh, is that uh, there's, there's quite a bigger, uh, a larger burden uh, of the caring for the elderly uh, in Hong Kong than people are aware of, and it's also growing very rapidly. Uh, just to give you one tidbit from other research, uh, and the folks at Civic Exchange can tell you more about this, um, we found that 20% of people over age 60 are also helping their parents in some way. So we have retirees helping retirees. So I think there's a whole interesting uh, connection uh, of uh, this question of affordability and how this generates uh, more widespread uh, reaction to it uh, than we might anticipate. There's an intervening variable there. Uh, I think in part it's this identity with the poor, the wealth gap, you know, the richer people seeing that. Then there's also, I think, in what may be even stronger, uh, is this uh, hidden burden of caring for the aging, uh, which really puts people who are fairly well off uh, into close contact with people who are not. Uh, that's the elder. So we've got time for one last question for Michael regarding the public opinion survey. Any last questions? Okay. If no, thank you, Michael, for taking the questions and taking the time, spending time with us, sharing some of the findings and taking some of the questions. What we want to do right now is to, well, this morning we talk about China, we talk about Guangdong, and then we talk about Hong Kong, in particular energy efficiency. And then in the second session, we looked at what you think about energy use and then test your knowledge and test your behaviors and concern and then with Michael presenting some of the findings. And we'd like to see if we can have an open discussion right now for about half an hour before we let you go, and then um, have some of the issues tease out regarding the energy use in Hong Kong. And then I'd like to spend some time right now to invite our panelists and the speakers up to the stage, Dr. Xu Yuan, and then Michael, and also Professor Johnny Chen, please. And then I also invite my colleague Simon Ng to come back onto the stage and to help moderate this session for us. And Michael, I think he will also stay with us, right? I think so. Silent consent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Simon, over to you. Well, thank you, Yan Yan. Um, well, this is quite fun, really, right? Um, we're trying out something new with technology, and then having my call on the other side of the ocean to join us this morning, uh, I mean, in the evening uh, in, in, in the US. Um, now, um, the setting, the cost is the same as before coffee. But I think right now, we have a bit more information about what people of Hong Kong are thinking about all these energy issues because of this uh, opinion survey. Um, instead of starting with the panelists, actually I would like to start with the floor. Um, are there any specific uh, areas or any findings that really strike your mind that you would like to comment or you have any questions to ask our panelists, uh, of course, and also uh, for Michael, because I think I'd like to have a more in-depth discussion and dialogue with you about all these important issues. Anyone who would like to start? Uh, we talk about, please. Uh, so I'm uh, from HQUSD. So it looks like uh, today there was no um, 
a question on validity of nuclear power that uh, I think that nuclear power um, is clean and cheap until um, it is disposed and after that all the prices come in and so um, in in uh, that aspect like why um, it, are people not saying anything about China building more um, nuclear power to support Hong Kong electricity and uh, even within China okay um, I think this is a question right uh, plus some comments or uh, elements on that now um, I think we we do talk a bit about you know nuclear uh, maybe not in, on this occasion but this is part of the energy mix discussion that we are having and we should have in the near future um, how to factor in nuclear and consider whether this is cleaner or what about the cause uh, and what's happening in, in this region uh, when it comes to uh, new nuclear power plants and whether those additional capacity can be used in Hong Kong in a uh, certain manner I think uh, I think Mike also comment this morning, and also uh, Professor Johnny Chan on you know this this question because someone uh, raised uh, the question about nuclear. Now uh, from Michael, Michael uh, from your survey, I mean uh, we we did spend a bit of time to think through you know how to uh, tease out people's concern and their knowledge about nuclear power use in Hong Kong, especially when some of those are or most of or all of them are actually coming from Guangdong. Um, can you shed some light on? On, on this question, and I'd also like to, you know, invite some of the panelists to respond to that as well. Michael, maybe you can you go first. Well, I, I think whenever we get into these uh, questions, uh, the worries about nuclear power um, don't seem to be based wholly on um, what you might say considered information. Uh, you, you saw those interesting results where you had people who said they. They knew about the health effects, and people said they didn't know about the health effects, and not that big a difference in their uh, levels of response in terms of uh, worry, for example. Uh, and that's what we find in nuclear power. There's a, a lot of people who are very worried or, or worried uh, about nuclear energy, um, and they admit, frankly, they're not that informed about it. Um, they seem to be more afraid of it. Uh, and of course, uh, fear uh, is one of the um, the emotions that actually kinds of short circuits are thinking. Um, so this is really a challenge, I think, to, to green groups and the government uh, to try to figure out a way to get people to think about something that uh, seems to be quite scary uh, to a lot of folks and which tends to short circuit uh, their ability to process information in any sort of you know fair and reasonable manner. Uh, you have a lot of people who are just simply scared uh, they may not even know why they're scared of it, uh, but they just are. And of course, uh, they may have seen pictures of what happened in uh, Fukushima, um, and uh, especially uh, older folks, seeing the older folks that were affected in Fukushima uh, who've been driven out of their homes and lost everything, uh, had to abandon even the photos of their loved ones. Uh, these are the kinds of emotional reactions uh, that really make um, any sort of intelli intellectual response, intelligent response, informed response. Uh, extremely difficult to get through uh, to folks. It's quite a challenge. Okay, thank you, Michael. Now I'd like to pass it on to uh, my panelists here. Um, are there ways you think we can um, facilitate or we can, you know, uh, carry out uh, better informed discussion when it comes to nuclear energy and the future of nuclear energy uh, in Hong Kong? Uh, what, what do you think uh, that can be done here to improve that discussion or dialogue? Anyone? For me, I'm, I'm a scholar, so I'm, well, my, best, uh, my best guess is uh, to, uh, my role is to try to provide um, information to the, to the general, general public. I'm not a decision maker. So I'm just a scholar to I try my best to give, you, uh, to give the entire uh, general public um, all the, the, the entire picture, not only the good side, but also the bad side, and what kind of things we can do about it. But I'm not a decision maker, so um, and, and I can probably can share with you um, a, a research uh, we are doing uh, on the public opinions about uh, nuclear energy. So we did an experiment. It's not a survey, a public opinion survey, but we did an experiment in the field. So we tried to check how reliable people are uh, on their opinions about anti or pro nuclear. So the experiment is really interesting. Um, so we have two questionnaires, two types of questionnaires, and respondents. 
did not know that there's uh, any existence of the other type. So they only know that they are answering one questionnaire, but they have no idea about the other. So one questionnaire, so uh, in, the, in the beginning, these two questionnaires are very, is identical. But then we started to provide some very basic information. Uh, but, but they are biased information. It's not full picture of nuclear energy. They're biased. <laughs> but uh, they're correct information. So once, for example, if you, one person is saying that nuclear energy could uh, compare with coal, it's much cleaner. It can reduce air pollution. It can reduce climate change. Then the people who are who answering this uh, this questionnaire, the ten, you know, after, after this very little information that is provided, they change their opinion to be more uh, pro-nuclear. So they want more nuclear energy because they thought, oh, it's great. Then the other type, <laughs> it's very probably another uh, very biased but correct information that there is a risk that nuclear accident, nuclear accidents could happen. You know, they, for this, for the people who answer these questionnaires. The, you know, their opinion suddenly changed to, uh, to more anti-nuclear. So when we compare these two, these two groups, it's pretty interesting about, uh, so about one quarter of the population of the people, the respondents, they will, they will stick to their anti-nuclear position no matter you know, which, which questionnaire they're, they're answering to. Another quarter, they will stick to their uh, pro-nuclear um, position no matter which, which questionnaire they're answering to. But half of the population, they, they switch. So, so just with very little information, they can they can change ideas. So for our scholars, we say that you know our for, for us it's the best thing for us to is to try our best to provide not just bias not bias people but entire picture for the decision makers the general public to make the uh, to make the full decision. And uh, when, when when the general public, general public makes a decision, and our opinion is that there's no perfect solution. So you you take the good side. And the bad side will also come. That's uh, what we have to say. Just, just one comment, kind of put this in perspective. Um, we had the comment from Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Here's one from Batman, when the immovable, immovable object meets the unstoppable force. What, the, what's the issue? Climate change on one hand, which is one can argue as just as potentially catastrophic as nuclear is on another hand, potentially catastrophic. Now, how do you reconcile these two given the choices that we have? What are the decisions that we actually have in front of us? What are the things that we in Hong Kong can influence? We can, what do we get to participate in? Can we make them all go away? If that is not a choice available to us, then we work the, the problem from a different direction. We make them as safe as possible. We participate in the debate. We, we welcome the climate change benefits of them. We, we study, we factor, we analyze all of the things that are potentially risked. We do that with analytics and best available information. We try to improve the government's credibility. It had the least credibility of all of those categories on that survey. That's shocking. Shocking. Appalling. How can we have an informed energy debate if we don't even trust what the government says about this? So it seems to me that also has to be brought into the nuclear debate. If we're going to talk about anything that's extreme tail risk, we actually have to be able to find trusted sources. Well, I, I really don't have much to add, uh, except and I think the, the problem with nuclear is that, uh, as the speakers have said, is there is a lot of uh, inadequate information in the uh, for the public so so uh, as especially uh, I mean before Fukushima everybody said there's no problem right so after Fukushima everything changed now but all they know is uh, what happens in Fukushima but they didn't know uh, why it happened and what's the difference between the nuclear power plants in Fukushima versus those in let's say Taipei. Bay or other parts of the world, and they just jump to the conclusion and say, "Look, this is bad, so we're going to shut it off." Germany said that, right? And some of the countries said that. So, so the the thing is, do we know enough, or does the public know enough, what actually went on there, what happened, why it happened, would it happen again in other other nuclear power plants? So, those are the issues that have to be uh, brought to the front of the, for the public. And then for them to decide, okay, well, uh, what 
choice do I have? Uh, if we don't do, use this, what are the alternatives? You cannot just say, okay, well, it's sort of like uh, diversifying a little bit about the um, landfills in Hong Kong. Everybody doesn't like landfill. But what are, what's the other choice? Um, nobody says that I mean, those people who are in power uh, uh, claim to be elected by the people, and they would just come out and say, we don't want this, but they don't have an alternative. So it's a similar sort of thing that you need to think about an alternative if you say that this is bad, uh, right? So if you can find a, find a good alternative, that's okay. But you have to say what the alternative is. Okay, I, I saw a hand from Edwin, um, you know, one of the most trusted group, uh, according to the survey. Uh, and also a hand from the lady in the, in the high. Uh, maybe Edwin first. Thank you. We now from uh, Friends of the Earth Hong Kong. Now you uh, mentioned about the the uh, different types of energy that uh, for responsible decision makers, I think those uh, uh, energy such as nuclear that we can see they are potential. I mean hazardous uh, 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 scenario. We have to stay away from those and reduce our reliance on those. And now we talk about, I mean, you talk about one type of energy which is non-renewable. The other type you talk about is renewable. And you can see the survey result is people have very little worry about those uh, renewable type. But there's still another type, the third type of energy, which is called the energy efficiency that we have been survey about. And that would people have any worry about if we do more, do harder on doing energy efficiency for wholesale, then uh, would that be a third type of energy that we as a community or as a government should push more for that? And I would like the panelists to uh, give your comments on the current scheme of control that the government signed with the power companies that do not give very much incentive for the power companies to do more in, in the area of uh, energy efficiency, but the scheme of control really give them incentive to invest more in infrastructure uh, facilities to gain more in return. So that give, I mean, the uh, the scenario for the companies to invest more in the power generating facilities in order to get more gain. But in then uh, there is no really helpful. Uh, scenario in reducing the uh, improving the energy efficiency, reducing wastage that could uh, address the issues of climate change, air pollution, and the finite uh, resources of the uh, non-renewable types. Yeah, I hope the panelists can uh, advise us. Thank you, Thank you Edward. I think I will uh, turn to the panelists on the stage first. But Michael, um, I think we. I mean, you did ask a few questions related to energy efficiency and some behavior related to that. Um, maybe if you want to chip in, just raise your hand. Uh, but I will first invite uh, the guests on the stage first. Well, I've already said about this energy efficiency, and I think there is a lot that can be done. Uh, and, and so uh, it's, it's whether we want to have incentives. And I think I agree with Michael that incentive will be the way to, to move forward in terms of uh, uh, encouraging people to use energy efficiency, but I mean, if you, you saw the survey, it seems that uh, a lot of people are not really um, informed or made the choice to do to uh, uh, read energy labels and so on. So, how do we uh, educate people to to learn more about this? And maybe as a very trusted NGO, <laughs> that will be. Uh, I mean, obviously, universities and educators together with NGOs can work uh, towards that area, I think. On the, on the issue of energy efficiency, it's a couple of things. Um, if it's cost effective, it's a good thing. If it's not cost effective, it's a bad thing. Very simple. What makes it cost effective? Are you taking into account all of the environmental and other benefits? Of course, you should do that. But 
to just say it's good, or to just say it's bad, or to just say this is the target and we're going to do everything we can to do it, doesn't actually get at the fundamental question of value for money or fundamental robustness of a program, or it doesn't even get at the question of who should do it. Does the power company do everything related to energy in Hong Kong? So the power companies are responsible for a relatively small part of the whole energy efficiency puzzle elsewhere. Behavioral change starts at home, right? Um, building standards start with governments. Appliance standards, labeling. Uh, you know, utilities can advise because they're wealthy, wealth of information from their expertise to you know how to do this and all that, but. If you want them to participate as aggressively as you would like them to participate, perhaps, and you know, you need to structure some programs around that. Let's not be silly. So it's obviously part of a solution. It's just what framework do we use for it? How how what is the analytical basis of it? What is the factual basis of it? What are the incentives of it? There are lots of people who want to do it, but at the end of the day, it's not just the power companies that deliver this anywhere. Well, Mike, uh, if I may go deeper with your response, um, since uh, you've got plenty of experience in different locations in, across the world, um, are there any good examples, really, that when you know, different stakeholders, including you know, the power company, uh, the green groups, uh, general public, the government, work really well together to you know, improve energy efficiency, whether it's the education about that or the actual practice? Uh, or providing incentives to, to do that. Uh, can, do you have anything come, that comes to mind? This, this is an interesting question. The world is a large place. Lots of people do lots of things differently. Um, you could spend your life studying California. All right? uh, spend, you could conclude that they do too much, too little, some things that are not very cost effective or whatever. What you can't argue is that they aren't progressively thinking about this. And what you can't argue is that they aren't trying innovative ways to involve utilities and other groups in the process of determining. And you can't argue that they don't try to do this with incentives. And you can't argue that they don't try to do this by keeping the shareholders whole as well as making the consumers uh, aware. So it's not a bad place to start in a journey that would ultimately take you through US, Europe, lots of different places along the way. Um, but the other thing is you've got to start here in Hong Kong. You know, it's like this is, um, uh, I mentioned the light bulb issue. Uh, it's a categorical difference between Hong Kong and the US. So many programs are oriented towards getting light bulbs in, in, in the United States. You've done most of that already here by substantial margin. People talk about buildings and whatnot. So there's building standard issues. So, you can take lessons from what people are doing, but at the end of the day, your basis has to be here in, in, in Hong Kong. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael, um, I noticed that you are yes. you are using natural light in your in your room, right? <laughs> Do you have anything to add to this discussion? Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there's, we've, we've asked a number of questions about this, um, and in terms of policy changes, uh, there's very clear and overwhelming support uh, for things uh, uh, like requiring developers to build more energy uh, efficient buildings um, and allowing, you know, changing the, uh, uh, the, the power agreement uh, to allow owners uh, to use renewable energy, uh, the, the grid uh, uh, connection uh, 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 policy. Um, and we also uh, ask about uh, the payback period uh, about buying energy efficient flats. And many of the people who are actually, practically speaking, uh, in terms of income, education, and so forth, and age, uh, more liable to buy uh, energy efficient flats, there's a fairly good degree of support uh, for a reasonable payback period of seven, ten years, or even more uh, for a smaller proportion uh, in terms of energy efficiency. So energy efficiency labeling in buildings and pushing that uh, is, is definitely supported by a significant proportion. And one of the really interesting things is also the policy was supported for requiring taxis, buses, and cars uh, to become electric vehicles. And of course, it's big news out here on the West Coast of the United States uh, that Tesla uh, is going to be selling hundreds of uh, its uh, Series S uh, cars in Hong Kong, uh, actually more than doubling the size of the electric car population in Hong Kong almost overnight, they say. That was the announcement 
just came out a few hours ago. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mike? Okay. Real quick. Just, just one last little thing on the energy efficiency uh, that occurred to me when you were speaking, Michael. Um, I, I think this is also an area, believe it or not, where a lot more is done in Hong Kong than people actually realize. Um, it's strange though it may seem, and maybe this is one of the reasons uh, you know, why. Uh, it's not what you don't know that's always the problem. It's what you know that's just not so. <laughs> it's a great quote from a, a Mark Twain, an author in, in the U.S. What you know that just ain't so. So I, I would encourage at least a little bit of looking out and seeing, you know, what Dominic's groups are actually achieving in these groups, and uh, what what the power companies are actually achieving, and if if what the effectiveness of information programs actually are. Again, it goes back to uh, making sure that we have our facts right before we go forward. Just uh, Simon was mentioning about natural light and, and that sort of triggered me to, to think about one thing in Hong Kong, which is in terms of energy efficiency, is that, um, I mean, you go around office buildings, uh, I guess most of us work in offices uh, most of the time, um, how much natural light is there in the building? Um, so just, I mean, in your office or in your, your neighboring offices and so on. So that's one thing that people are not, uh, I always blame the architects because when they design buildings, they, I, every time I talk to architects, I said, you guys are not doing a, a good job in, uh, in helping us save energy, uh, which is true. Uh, now, so, so this is one thing that, uh, why is it not the case? Number one is because it costs more, uh, because in fact, as, um, we're now um, in, in, in CTU and, and our School of Energy and Environment is expanding and we're trying to uh, build partitions on another, another uh, section of the campus. And I said I want to use glass panels so that I can have natural light. And the answer I got is, okay, well, you have to pay for it. University won't pay for it because it costs too much. It costs more than plaster walls, okay? Um, so I said, what? But we are going to save energy? Uh, yeah, but it's going to be more expensive. So, so this is the type of mentality that uh, most um, uh, people in Hong Kong are thinking about. All right? So they are, they, they're looking at uh, the bottom line and say, okay, well, it's going to cost too much. But they're not looking at it from the energy efficiency side. They're not looking at it from the carbon side. Um, they're looking at it only from the uh, perspective of cost. So that's a change of mindset that's necessary. And so uh, if we can change the mindset of people and not just looking at money and the bottom line itself, but looking at the three Ps that people have been saying, um, that there might be uh, a way to, to help us save energy. Uh, because we have touched on this, uh, uh I can, uh, uh, this uh, one research I'm trying to do is, uh, is we try to compare the voluntary agreements in Hong Kong with enforcement. And uh, one is, uh, is uh, WWF's uh, uh, the Earth Hour. It seems that everybody is participating in that program. The other one is the 25.5 degrees thermostat setting for air conditioners. I'm not sure about uh, what kind of degree we set here. But, uh, so this two, it's two, it's two policy is very interesting when we talk about energy efficiency. Because Earth, Earth Hour, it seems a lot of people are participating. But uh, um, most people will, will complain that our shopping malls, our libraries are too cold. The 25.5 degrees, there's also not a voluntary agreement. It's not, not many people are participating, really, in that case. So we try to understand what happened. Why is, you know, more and more people are, are participating in Earth Hour, but not many uh, in that 25.5 in that degrees thermostat setting. So one hypothesis we have is because people can see whether you can participate in the Earth Hour or not. It's very easy to see uh, from outside. So the, the monitoring for this very simple policy is easier. And also just one hour every year. You know, it's uh, the cost on the, on, the, on, the, on the participators are low. Now, on, on the other hand, for the 25.5 degrees, you know, for example, you have an Earth Hour saying, saying that you have to shut down your air conditioner for one hour. But, well, it, because you, you're not going to see from outside. It's very easy, it's very difficult to check, to monitor to verify whether this policy has been enforced. 
So uh, I'll guess that uh, if, even if you have this kind of uh, agreement, it will be very difficult to enforce. So for the energy, energy efficiency side, it's, uh, we do have a lot of, a lot of uh, potential to achieve. It's, it's a single most important thing we have to do on energy, but uh, um, of course there are a lot of difficulties and we have to, we have to do uh, to, in order to achieve more. Well, thank you, Xu Yuan. Um, there's a lady at the back. Uh, sorry for keep you waiting. And uh, Jacqueline also have a question after that. Yes, hello. My name is uh, Rita, Knowledge Dialogues. Um, and I have a question regarding the survey. Um, there was this uh, result that uh, the concern about Hong Kong's energy supply was very low. I mean, most people don't bother. So there was the answer was uh, none or not much. The majority said they don't, they don't bother. And so I wonder if the, could, the panel could uh, elaborate on that because I think it is mainly because we have no choice. So we have a, we have a duopoly in Hong Kong with energy supply. So as a citizens, I cannot do anything. I mean, uh, I mean, in, in terms of I can change my behavior, but in terms of supply, I have no choice at all. So if if there were um, more competition and more energy supply uh, providers, then maybe citizens would be really get concerned because you can make a choice. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Michael, do you want to tackle this first? Uh, about, you know, um, people not concerned at all in Hong Kong about energy supply. Is it because we don't have much choice? Well, of course, that, it's, um, if we're talking only about uh, electrical energy, um, then that's true. Um, if we're talking about other forms of energy, uh, in, in, in th th this is interesting uh, that I, I've noted this, and when I talk to uh, friends from the mainland, mainland China, uh, they talk about they, they consider Hong Kong kind of primitive in that we do not have a lot of solar hot water uh, and so, solar uh, photovoltaic cells uh, up in our roofs, especially solar hot water. Um, and I've noticed in the village areas where I live. Uh, the more and more people are actually putting up uh, solar hot water um, uh, installations. Now, I know technically a lot of that is probably uh, uh, illegal, according to the building department. Uh, and this is one of the problems that we have, I, I think, elaborating on that, is that not only do you have no choice, but even when you want to make a choice, many times government policies uh, stand in the way. So if you want to put up a solar hot water installation, uh, there's all kinds of barriers to it. If you want to put up a uh, solar PV, uh, same thing. Uh, there, there's a lot less uh, support. It's far more complex. Uh, and if you compare or contrast that to, for example, what California has done uh, with the solar photovoltaic on the rooftops, um, they've had a terrific impact uh, in, in terms of between wind and solar panels. Uh, California has reduced the need to build um, it's more than more than ten uh, power plants uh, now, and so there's a there's a lot we could do that we're not doing. Uh, maybe this concern has to do with the sense of helplessness. It certainly is an element of helplessness about, for example, affordability that gets there. So we can't understate that factor that helplessness does get in there, since the people have no choice or that they're not allowed to choose. Thank you, Michael. Any insight from the panel? On the choice one, that's um, interesting. Usually people say that they want a choice so they can get something cheaper. And, and of course, if it's cheaper, you'll use more of it, which is a reasonably robust conclusion. So, um, and when, when we, we do a little bit of tariff benchmarking, we, 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 we do some surveys around the world. And one of the things we, we struggle with always is the uh, UK uh, to try to figure out, you know, the the customer perspective on a residential tariff offering in a competitive market, you go through 20 or 30 or more different offerings. Um, and there are some green ones and there are some other ones, but mostly it's confusing. And, um, and the regulators had to come in and, and, and talk about you know, forcing simplification of the tariff offerings, which is of course not anything somebody would have said 10 years ago was going to be the outcome of competitive retail markets, and they should sort themselves out through competition. So it's a complicated problem, um, this, whole, um, this whole thing. OK. Um, Jacqueline. OK, 
Can you keep it short, please? Okay. Um, my question is, we talk about uh, the technical details about the field mix this morning. Uh, we mentioned uh, most about uh, what type of instruments will be effective and how about the behavior uh, pattern, how does it affect uh, the energy use and climate change. But uh, I think coming up to the uh, final question is, we need a plan to go ahead. So um, most of the time, uh, the, the talk is about uh, the aspirations of the society, but then there is uh, less uh, informed decision-making uh, evidence to support what type of scenario we want. So I think uh, there is a need of integration. Uh, maybe in future, we need to develop a roadmap together with the input from government. The government is not present uh, at the moment. And uh, with, with all these talks, we need a sum up of everything. So I hope that the government or the, 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 the private sector uh, oh. <laughs> Uh, all of us can work together and we really make something happen. Uh, I think uh, Christine has been mentioned for a long time and I look forward to such a thing to come into reality in Hong Kong. Well, actually, for a change, the uh, government's in the room, not just Christine, but there's someone else, uh, I, I, I can promise you. Um, any response from the government? <laughs> Christine, please. Well, I must apologize. I wasn't able to be here for the whole morning. Um, but I will read the papers that you put out. I think the issue about energy, it really is a very complex uh, problem. And we might want to ask ourselves, what is it that we want to do in Hong Kong at this stage? And um, I think Mike Thomas, you sort of said, well, what are you gonna do here? Um, I think there are many things that we can be doing, and it's not all that what government must do. I think government has to play a very important part and I wonder, as we go forward on, um, I would say probably for the next two years, we'll have much more public stakeholder discussion relating to energy, is how you want to have this discussion. Are we going to have one where uh, the advocates of certain things will say we don't want to look at it, like nuclear power? Uh, are we going to have people saying, you know, we don't like the utilities because they're making too much money? Uh, or are we going to have something more sensible where we can be kind of more calm and collected just to look at some facts? And from the facts, what kind of roadmap do we want? Um, how ambitious can we be? And what are the real choices? Um, now. If we can have that kind of discussion, I'd be very, very keen. I'd be quite keen to organize discussions where we can have that kind of discussion. And it's a fairly long journey because I don't think we can make decisions just by having one or two discussions. So, I mean, maybe I throw back to, to you all. Um, how, how do you think we can have that discussion? Right? Secondly is, I'm as worried as, uh, as uh, I think, uh, as you, uh, when you say, well, you know, government has the lowest trust. Now, but I, I want to ask this question so that you can help us think about it. If we have low trust, what it means is nobody's going to believe what we say. So, whilst we're not always wrong, how can we have that discussion where ultimately government has to act and make some decisions? Under what circumstances will you want to engage in government where you think we know something and we can make these decisions together? This is not easy. And, uh, I think, Johnny, you mentioned the landfills, right? So that's something we're going through right now. Are we going to have a repeat performance? Probably yes. When we start discussing energy issues. And I think you folks who are in this room are making a, an assumption that you're interested in the energy issue. But when the politics comes to it, there'll be a whole bunch of other people who wouldn't have come to any of your discussions who will have a view. Now, how do we handle that? Now, you're probably going to say, okay, that's for the government to handle, right? The politics. <laughs> which is only partially true. Which is only partially true. So one of the things that I'm afraid we'll just have to struggle through together is, first of all, to get the facts right. And secondly, to have informed discussion about what options we really have in Hong Kong. So we all have some clarity. Government needs to suck in some of 
you know, these, these facts and ideas and perspectives uh, from the people, from experts, you know, from different parts of the world. And then we need to make some decisions. Making the decisions, getting the decisions done is a political process, which then involves many more people than you. Right? So that's the journey for the next two years. Thank you, Christine. Uh, now, I saw some hands from the floor, but we are really running out of time. If um, you might engage yourself in more dialogues and discussion after you know, this event, um, I, I think that's maybe the best way to go. Um, I would like to hear from the panel and also maybe from Michael, uh, whether you have otherwise work to share um, based on what Christine has just said. Uh, one last chance. Um, agreed. Um, so after we have uh, discussed all of this, for some other scholars I said, I try my best to provide the information. But in, in the end, we have to make a decision. But any decision that will be a tough decision. There's, uh, there's no perfect decision. There's no perfect solution. So I really agree that you know, we have, uh, so from my perspective, after I have done all of this research, I try, uh, you know, um, I try my best to, to say that what kind of things, what kind of good things can, that can happen, not just in discussion. But now it will come to decisions. And, uh, and the, the problem is that there's no perfect solution. No matter what kind of decision you make, there's a balance between two sides. But uh, this kind of decision is really difficult to make. And, uh, but we have to make it. Um, uh, to the points that, that Christine very well put, I, I cannot disagree with any of them. I think they're, they're spot on. The question is, can you have a sensible engagement to form factually based views? But I'll make one other comment. Governments aren't necessarily trusted on these matters anymore anywhere else. Hong Kong's not unique in having a government that's not trusted on energy matters. Energy matters are actually pretty complicated, technically oriented, and ought not to be so politicized in my own naive view of the world, of course. Um, so what has happened in other countries where governments have become untrusted or untrusting of the energy sector, there has been formation of independent regulators, independent of the politics, or other structures which are more technically oriented that have been removed from the legislature, at least as a first approximation. Why? To solve this very problem, to bring the technical aspects and the factual aspects and the economic aspects to this and try to decouple it somewhat from the political ones. I'm not saying that the solution, it, 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 it's hard everywhere, but Hong Kong shouldn't feel beaten up just by the survey, because I, I would struggle to find another government that can competently claim to be expert in these matters and trusted by society uh, to, to lead on some of these matters. Um, I just want to add the, that uh, we, will, we will work with you, Christine, and. Uh, and other groups to, to help um, hopefully bring out a, a, an optimal scheme that uh, works for the best of Hong Kong. Michael, um, I noticed you're running out, running out of coffee. Um, <laughs> one last word from you. Well, I, I think one of the other things we have going on is that this is a conjunction of literally power and money. Uh, not just uh, you know the government is is only one of the actors here on these two really fundamental areas that that uh, there's a lot of disagreement on uh, not just in Hong Kong but worldwide um, and and of course we we face also disruptive technologies which are changing that relationship um, and and so the the whole distribution of power generation of power use of power paying for power decisions about power, um, movement of power sources and so forth, we are living in times of great change. Now, of course, that means we also live in times of great opportunity. You know, we, have, we do have a chance to, to make some differences. Uh, and of course, facing climate change, I don't think we have a lot of choice. Uh, so it's really important for us, even if we don't trust the government, uh, to get our acts together in such a way that we can at least agree on what the facts are uh, and what our interests are. And uh, I, think, I think there is hope for that because I think it's more and more apparent to more and more people around the world that we don't have a choice. 
We have to act. Okay. Well, thank you, Michael. Um, I'm going to let you go to enjoy your evening. Um, so please uh, give a big hand to Michael from the U.S. And, um, and for the second time uh, today, please also give a big hand to our panelists and speakers. Thank you. Now, um, I think um, Christine actually has delivered the perfect closing remark for us. <laughs> so I'm not going to ask her to say it again, or I'm not going to repeat you know, some of the points. Um, but thank you so much for sticking with us for the entire morning. Um, and um, Civic Change is going to continue with our effort to improve energy literacy in Hong Kong. And by doing these kind of forum and engagement and also uh, publications of reports and pamphlets and other information, uh, we hope we can contribute a little bit to this uh, discussion in the future. And hopefully uh, this process will also help uh, the government to continue with the effort to come up with an energy policy and also uh, in their process of engaging more people in the discussion. Um, and please stay tuned with uh, our publication because as Ian uh, mentioned earlier today, we're going to publish the full report for this uh, 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 opinion survey uh, probably in September when Michael is back in Hong Kong. Um, and also we are going to organize another energy forum. So that would be Energy Forum 16. Uh, it will be in September again. I think it's the 14th of September. So please mark your diary. Uh, we will announce it on our website and also through our newsletter the, the focus of the next uh, forum, uh, maybe next month. But please stay tuned and uh, hopefully I will see you again in our future events. So thank you once again. Thank you so much. Have a nice Saturday. Thank you.